Hello, my name is Nicholas Allen, and as director of the Wilson Center for Humanities and Arts at the University of Georgia, I am involved in the Coasts, Climates, Humanities and the Environment Consortium, which is funded by a pilot grant from the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, for which we are all very grateful. The Mellon Foundation support has enabled researchers at the University of Georgia, the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, the University of Florida, and Louisiana State University to build a series of site-specific and publicly engaged research projects in coastal places, which look at questions of climate breakdown, community alliance in face of historical and contemporary marginalization, and the capacity of the humanities to imagine the futures of places under threat from storms and sea level rise. Our site-specific research has been interrupted, like everything else, by the pandemic. One of our aims is to create a series of online masterclasses on the subject of coastal studies. And given this is something we can do remotely now, I have asked a number of friends to take part in a series of conversations that we will share online. Some of these will be broader conversations about the coast as a site of study and the diverse approaches evolving to engage with it. And some, like today, will be anchored in specific subjects connected to the consortium. Joining me now are three wonderful colleagues whose work is creatively engaged with diverse coastal communities in the southeastern United States. Jacqueline Lawton, Steve Berry and Ken Sassman are connected by their deep interest in coasts, people and water. I appreciate their taking the time to be with us today and to share their perspectives on coastal studies in this era of climate breakdown. Beginning with Jacqueline and moving to Steve and Ken in turn, I'm going to ask a series of short questions with time for some discussion after. And after watching this, if you have questions of your own for any of us, please do email me and we will try to continue the dialogue as the consortium moves forward. So Jacqueline, greetings. Hello there. Your art, your creativity, about which I've enjoyed reading very much, and your scholarship has shaped new approaches to partnership and to alliance with communities nationally. And you were recognized as a leading voice in contemporary theater. I wanted to begin by asking you how a medium like water can speak to a drama that represents the present and the past, that speaks to community and to expression and features as it does in the title of one of your plays. Oh my goodness, yes. Wow, that's such a very big, beautiful question. Um, for me, water is life. For me and many others, water is life. We look at um, ambiotic fluid, it, it, you know, before it's filled with anything else, it's, it's water. Um, so it's, it's essential. Um, me as an individual, I actually have a bladder disorder, so I can actually only drink water. Um, so it is, it is essentially my life. Um, in my work, so there's a, the play that, that you mentioned, which the first title of that play was By Way of Water. Um, I think that's the play that you're, you're thinking of, yes? Um, that the play title shifted after I was in conversation with the community. So originally the play by way of water was telling the story of the people of Princeville, North Carolina and Princeville, North Carolina is a historically black town that was established um, at the end of the uh, civil war. Um, and the people who live there since its founding, um, have struggled with floods year after year after year, quite devastating, completely abolishing everything in its sight. And there's been a powerful resilience to the people who are there because they continue to rebuild. And when I went to meet the people who currently live there now, I was interested in telling the story of, of, of recovery, um, understanding where they are in the recovery now, what are the steps they're taking. And for me, the question was, um, they're in a rebuilding of a town that is continually flooded. Are you rebuilding, meaning are you putting houses on stilts, are you reinforcing the land, um, or are you moving further away? And so I was trying to find out what does that mean, this historically established town, if it moves away, is it still, is it still the town? Like, is it still, because you think about the earth, earth is essential, of course, as well. The people who are buried there, you know, the, the people who walk the, 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 the streets there when they were dirt pavements and now they're concrete and all the other things that are there, um, how does that transform? So when I went to meet the people, the terms of recovery were still about, um, so many people were displaced still. So the people who lived in the town were, were scattered about still, but they were trying to figure out how do we come together? How do we be, uh, rebuild? How do we restructure? 
And I realized that the now of the story is still happening. And so the story that needs to be told is a very different one. Partly because in 1999, when um, the hurricane came, it destroyed their museum. Um, and as we know, museums hold our, our history, our legacy, potential for future. It was destroyed. What they had left, the remnants of their museum was in a, like a water closet. You know, four or five items were left. And um, what I realized is they, what they needed a reconstruction of their, of their history. So I ended up adapting the play Our Town by Thornton Wilder, but layering it over. Um, so before Princeville was Princeville, it was Freedom Hill. It was called Freedom Hill. And so I told the story of its founding. Um, because these were people who were still very much, even now, impacted so deeply by these floodwaters um, that, that happen every year. And I'm so, you know, I'm really so worried because now that we have, I'm, I'm straying so far from your, your question, but uh, when I think about storytelling, I think about who the people are who are here right now, what stories are needed and how are they living their lives? Because part of, as a playwright, I am, the, the world of theater is the exploration of the human condition. So as a playwright, that's what I'm putting on stage, you know, for 60 minutes to two hours to three hours, whatever it is I'm writing, I'm exploring an aspect of the human condition. And for these uh, particular, this particular community of people, uh, their human condition, <clears throat> it was so, it is still so fraught. Um, and I think about now when we're, when we're still very much in the first wave of COVID-19 and the way to protect ourselves is to socially distance. And what happens when natural disasters come, there's a gathering of people together. And so I'm so worried about, I'm so worried about all of those folks. So as a playwright, that's what I'm looking at. I'm looking at how do we tell the stories of the people from their particular point of view? Because like my, point of view in is purely of interest and engagement and of lifting up voices like it's not my opinion of a thing that needs to be the thing that that comes forward so with a play like that I went and spoke with the people who live there and I read as much as I possibly could about them from their point of view also taking in of course what others were saying because that's a context as well um I hope that gets close to you know, it's perfect, actually. Okay. Because, yeah, no, no, well, I've always thought, or I've begun to think at least that in coastal literature, if we can call it that in the broadest sense, that digression is actually ah. the fabric of it. There's something in the eddy of speech that allows yeah. a kind of a freedom of movement and maybe a freedom of association that might have been denied in certain other kinds of contexts. And I think that's right. what and you're speaking to. does that, right? Because water takes the shape of the container it's in. You know, like it doesn't tell you... Like it, it defines itself as it finds itself. And I think that that's something that's that's really beautiful and freeing about what water teaches us to be. Well, tell me then, Jacqueline, and I want to come back to you actually about some of the stories that you heard that perhaps you might share, because I think one of the <clears throat> other functions that we're trying to have in this conversation is share with people in other places some methods and experiences you've learned of speaking with people and about creating these kinds of alliances. You're talking about the commodity. Yeah. The but just before we get there and to stick for the moment to the question of language, Oh you said it was only your job in a way to share these voices, but I wonder in your own construction of writing, have you begun to write differently because you've begun to think more fluidly? Has the language you've used changed? The water might take a shape of the vessel, but the vessel is in the end your play. How have you oh, played? sure. <laughs> oh, that's, I really appreciate that question. So no one play looks or sounds the same. And um, there are times when, like I am a, like I am, I understand structure. So when I write a play, I know already going in what the structure of the play will be. So like a big question will be asked, I'll ask a big question from the universe and I'll say, who are the people I need in the play to tell this story? Backdrop, setting, location, do a bunch of research. And then I lay out an outline for um, the, the greatest, um, emotional landscape that can convey what's happening and but the situation with freedom hill right i had this like my play my play if i had written it the play i thought i was going to write by way of water was about a community-based um community-based like city planner who is coming in to help reshape the town 
having listened to the people there. So we would have seen how sometimes when the state comes in, they've got a, an item that they have to follow, a budget they have to follow, and they're not listening to the people. Um, and I remember speaking actually with the city planner who inspired me, and she said, that's, that's not how it works. <laughs> and if you tell that story, it's going to distort the truth of what actually happens. Like very few of us get to do that the first time out. And so that play had to fall away completely. And I had to just sit down in conversation. So that, that's about getting the ego out of the room, right? Because like it wasn't, the important thing was not what I wanted to do, it was the story that needed to be told. And so when I sat down and spoke with um, the town manager actually, to hear where she was in her, her every day of just trying to find everyone and trying to remind people, okay, you gotta take care of your garden, you gotta take care of your yard, we can't have you know junk piling up, that kind of thing. Um, it, it changed, it completely changed the shape of what the story was going to be, um, or what I thought the story was going to be. So I do truly believe that my writing, like the language of my writing, the language of the plays, take the shape of what the characters and the story needed to be which commands me to be constantly on top of my craft, right? Like I've got to constantly be reading and watching plays and studying playwrights and how they're approaching their work because it, like I can't rely on my old tricks. Like the things I know how to do well isn't always what is a service to the story that needs to be told. Um, so like water taking the shape of the form it's in, I do feel that my writing calls me to do that, that very thing. Yeah, that's a wonderful story you shared with us there yeah. about working with the local bureaucracy as a state as well to you know yeah. uh, represent the story in a different way and i suppose maybe before we move on to steve to ask you a broader question perhaps which is that you know one of the things that we thought about with this consortium was that uh, we would learn from each other yeah and uh we would learn at scale and we would learn how we might speak with each other and speak with the largest and most diverse groups of communities that we could in partnership with the institutions from where we work. Mm -hmm. And I wondered now, since you've been doing that kind of work in North Carolina, and now we have this opportunity to do it in a southeastern context, just I wondered, because also you have such a national reputation in your own theatre work, have you any thoughts about how collectives such as the one we were involved with can really make a change by working together on the larger scale? I do. <laughs> I do because I see this work happening in the American theatre and um, particularly around the work of Theatre for Social Change. Um, we cannot have assumptions. We may have our findings, we may have the endpoint of what we know we want to achieve, we may have exactly what it looks like, but we can't, have, we can't walk in with assumptions. We can't walk in thinking that we know more than the people that we're engaging with. Um, we can't walk in thinking that they have not themselves already done work similar to this. So we have to come into this work really, truly open and aware of how our institutions the, the, the reputation of our institutions can impact the people. So it's about building trust. You have to build trust, you have to listen deeply, and you've gotta be willing to be wrong and be wrong out loud and bold and say, course correction, I'm making a huge course correction right now. Um, so humility is huge in this work. And it doesn't mean that you know the expertise that you train for years and years to do is not valid. It is essential. It is only as essential as the people you're coming to need it to be. Um, so that that's my biggest takeaway is the deep listening, humility, relief, you know, re leave the ego away. Like it can never, it's not useful in this in this type of work and engagement. And I feel like it needs to be community led. It really needs to be community led. Because if you come in here, it's like, oh, I've got a big idea. I heard that this was of interest. Do you want to do it? And they say, actually, no. What would be more useful is this. Then I think for us, it's like, okay, well, let's let's recalculate and see how we can apply, you know, what our grant told us, what we told the grant we were gonna do to what's actually needed here on the ground. That's that's what I would encourage all of us to be doing. Yeah, thank you for your wisdom. It doesn't sound unlike the making of a work of art either. In the way yes, that very much so. And I, I hope, I mean, I think one of the things that we tried very much to do was to build organically in projects that had been in place for a while too. So absolutely. Thank you for that advice and wide words. Thank you. So Steve, we are 
old friends at this stage, time goes so quickly, but I've followed your career through its many iterations and in a way that Coast isn't a place that strikes me as the first point of departure for your work. And yet it seems to feature more and more in the kind of work that you're doing at the moment. And I just wondered, I mean, you've had an experience in working in different places in the United States and also growing up even from your childhood in different places in the United States. And I, I wondered if you had any broad observations about water and coastlines and how they've started and come back in your work over the years. Absolutely. Um, so I'm an historian by training and um, I've j I just finished um, a new book uh, called Count the Dead, Coroners, Quants, uh, and the Birth of Death as We Know It, which is really about the importance of death records um, to improvements in public health, to social justice, um, to remembering our war dead. And none of it had anything to do with the coast, um, except that it brought me to an understanding of beyond mortality, contemplating vanishing, erasure, uh, extinction, and extinction events um, more broadly. Uh, which is the, hi the history that I've started to write now, specifically extinction events along the coast um, and how human beings for generations, right, uh, were witnessing our own ecological catastrophe, but there have been uh, catastrophes that came before um, and uh, folks who bore them witness and bear witness for us now um, and give us um, some kind of guidance. So why do that kind of work along the coast? I mean, the effects of climate change are everywhere in wars, famines, dislocations, political unrest around the globe. But where you can see time happening um, and change happening fast enough that you can see and feel it is really along the coast. Um, and then also the, the waves of time that are washing against us and eroding us uh, bit by bit and returning us to the sea, all of that metaphorical um, valences of how we feel and experience history uh, in our own lifetimes uh, has become really important to me. So in addition to doing the work of writing uh, the history of extinction events uh, along the coast, we've developed uh, a new app that we've just launched, uh, I'm proud to say, called You Are Here, which collects the personal histories of people along the coast. Basically what the app does is allow them to tag any permanent object um, in their environment and then tell the story of the change over time that they've seen um, relating, to that, uh, relating to that object. And the idea is to collect the stories of the men and women who are really on the front line of the ecological catastrophe that's already upon them. So in a way it is in keeping with the work that you've been doing and that I associate you very much with the work of witness and also the work of the archive. And how do you find now being in the process of creating an archive rather than referring to one? Although I do also realize that in referring to one, you are making it. Right, um, and I, I think this relates to my frustration around the politics of climate change to a degree. Um, it's obviously settled science, um, but very unsettling uh, politics. And we seem to think that we only have two modes for talking about climate change. One is the language of the scientific and the other is the language of the sacred. Um, and the truth is that neither is complete in itself and neither really seems to be uh, changing the politics. So what we're trying to do is find this uh, third way, which we'll, we'll call the personal historical. Um, people may not care about what climate change is doing in far flung countries. They may not even agree that it's man-made, but they do care about their own backyard. Um, the, the, we need to meet them uh, where they are, where they see change happening. They care about their neighborhood. They, they have expertise, real expertise, in the minute changes that they're seeing in their gardens every year. Um, and they're reflecting on how that relates to their own changes in their body, uh, their own mortality, their own eventual extinction, and maybe a larger extinction of, of humankind. So the idea with this archive is really to connect the stories of past peoples who've endured dramatic changes along the coast with present peoples as they bear witness to transformations that are occurring in their own lifetime. Yeah, this thread of embodiment, and um, we began with Jacqueline, and thank you for sharing that, has come up through many of the conversations, whether it's been to do with swimming, uh, to do with the experience of water, living by the water, being by the different modes. We had a wonderful conversation with uh, Rand Emanuel and him talking about 
his river run experience as a person of Lumbee community and thinking about what water meant to him as opposed to people who thought of it as being oceanic or on the far horizon. So there's been these different modes have been very much part of the conversation. I suppose they've surprised me a little by their uh, breadth and width. It makes me think, however, Steve, about one other um, part of the alliances you've created with students, with students and if not the embodiment, the experiential and the plans you've had for working with students and bringing them to these places by the coast of taking them out into these watery estuarial places and giving them a different perspective of the present through the past. I wonder if you talk a little bit about your work with the students. Yeah, um, I'm really excited about the class that we'll be teaching um, in, in the spring now. Um, and the class is devoted to the photography of Huron Smith. Uh, he wasn't a pho photographer by training. Um, he was the leading dendrolo dendrologist and ethnobotanist in the United States, or one of them. Uh, at the turn of the 20th century. Um, and he worked in Milwaukee, um, mostly with native tribes who you're at the height of the Dawes Act, tribal councils have been dissolved, all of their agricultural and herbal knowledge. Um, he's deeply concerned that it's being lost and he's trying to write it down as quickly as possible. Um, and it's while he's doing that work that he turns to Georgia um, as the uh, lumber industry is just tearing uh, Georgia apart. Um, and so he rushes down and spends two years in Georgia taking pictures of uh, the lumber industry working at full tilt. And then he juxtaposes these images of sort of murdered trees um, with a photograph of the tree that owns itself, the only tree that owns itself in Athens, Georgia. Um, and with uh, the John Wesley tree on St. Simon's Island, which has a sign slung around it that says, do not mutilate or cut. And so he's a ethnobotanist, he's uh, a dendrologist, but he's an artist too, in the way that he's juxtaposing these photographs. And so each one of the students is taking one of the photographs and using it as a jumping off point um, to write a history of a particular sawmill or a particular tree. Uh, or of Huron Smith himself. I'm struck by both how you and Jacqueline face the catastrophic with the aesthetic and it's not a kind of resilience narrative or even a kind of um, narrative of return to go back to your sacred metaphor but something more. I, I mean it seems almost in spite of all of these things there is a kind of persistence. I mean, you, you've spent your life, a lot of your scholarly life now working into the grimmest of records. And yet, am I right to sense some kind of optimism? Maybe you could say something about this larger collective again. What if what we can discover about each other by speaking together? I think that humanity coheres in what we survive together. I think that's um, true of a marriage, um, true of a friendship, um, true of a people. Right. Um, it's how we face the difficult times uh, together that matters most. And so even though I'm writing about extinction, I'm writing. So I'm also writing about endurance um, and I'm writing about um, what past people endured to provide us lessons in how we might um, honor them, carry the good lessons forward, live the bad ones down uh, and endure as a more humble people. Samuel Beckett said, feel again, feel better. Beautiful. Steve, thank you. I've um, enjoyed being your colleague for a long time. I look forward to continuing in the future. Thank you. Now, Ken, how are you? Fine, thank you. Glad so, to be with you. Thank you, and you. And uh, I have admired your work for a long time, too. And actually, one of the great pleasures of the consortium has been, like, as with Jacqueline, discovering these uh, modes of scholarship connected to coastal communities, to deep time that I was familiar with the ideas that would be associated with, but not the particularity and the work that you've done that I can see even displayed on your lab wall behind you has gone into the very deepest time. So I know that you've worked around this curve of the southeastern coast from your earlier career working in South Carolina and thinking about Georgia and then moving around to Florida. And I just wondered in a broad sense, would you mind as an archaeologist, as an individual, 
sharing with us how you began to be interested in coastlines and water and why you think they're important to our understanding of the past and the present. Sure, and um, and I'll also explain in this little uh, little route that I that I arrived at the late 19th century recently after spending close to 40 years now dealing with the, the mid-Holocene between 8,000 and 3,000 years ago. So as, a, as an archeologist of the Southeastern US, um, I have to take the coast into consideration and its dynamics, even when studying communities that are far removed from the coast, such as the Middle Savannah River Valley of Georgia and South Carolina, where I worked throughout the 90s. Um, the seasonal migrations of those ancient Native Americans, their trade relationships, their marriage alliances, connected the coast to the interior uh, throughout that ancient past. So it can't, it can't be avoided, even if you choose to be a landlubber like me. Um, but here's, here's the trick. Um, the coastal record of the American Southeast is truncated at about 5,000 years ago because of sea level rise and the coastal erosion that comes from that. It's, it's the equivalent of, of knowing nothing about Euro-American history before the 19th century. It's really only half of the coastal story. Uh, I certainly came to that stark realization when I moved to Florida 22 years ago and began working on the, the Florida Gulf Coast. Uh, the modern coastline where I work is about 200 kilometers east of where the position of the coast was when humans arrived 14,000 years ago. Uh, and so the sea's risen about 80 meters since then. Much of that rise occurred in the first couple of millennia of the post-glacial era. So if you lived on the coast, say at 13,000 years ago, over the course of your, your childhood, you would see your coastal home inundated. The rate back then was, was incredible. In fact, we haven't seen anything like it since. Uh, but it's not out of stride with what uh, the projections are for sea level rise if in fact the West Antarctic and Greenland ice sheets collapse, which is one of the great uncertainties. The, the IPCC, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, has been reluctant to include those projections for the future because we have no modern data on the rate and magnitude of those sorts of processes, right? So thinking about this and thinking about the deep time that you mentioned, I've, I've long been interested in the relationship between actual experience and expectation. The, the horizon of expectation that comes from the space of one's experience. It's really hard for us to fathom what a six meter increase in sea level rise over this century would look like, but it doesn't mean it never happened before. I was, I was struck by what something that Steve said about, you know, the, the events that seem to be unprecedented certainly have historic precedents. We just need to understand them and, and, and investigate them a little bit better. The trouble with the really ancient past is that it's so remote um, that it's, it's difficult to be captured and, and passed along through collective memory. And it's also considered irrelevant by many modern people because of its incommensurability with the present. I think that's true with COVID too. We haven't heard as much about the 1918 pandemic. It's highly relevant, but I think a lot of people think that we move past the medicine and science of the early part of the last century. And so it's, it's a different world now. So why would coastal past matter if we have these sort of like, you know, inhibitions to connect past with the futures? That's because I think that coastal futures are not likely to be as exceptional um, as any other futures past. So if we're willing to bend time and hold at bay the kind of usual linear narratives of history, that past experiences could actually be mobilized better through storytelling, memory making, to lessen the uncertainty of, of coastal futures. And let me add one other thing, and I think this resonates with what our, my fellow panelists have already mentioned. Any effort to try to mobilize the past in terms that are decoupled from bodily experience, um, that makes things worth remembering, is not likely to be heeded. Our stories have to be biographical, they have to be very personal, and they certainly have to be multi-sensory. So it's kind of led me to a new project now. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll be happy to explain that unless you want to redirect uh, no, my discussion. So I'm sitting here nodding my head because actually the question I wanted to ask you subsequent to this was about 
and partly prompted by what I see behind you, but in thinking about archaeology, perhaps in a very amateur way, but an, an object or a, like a, a moment that's a bit like the stories that Jacqueline talked about with her uh, conversation with her colleagues down at the coast, like an object, a thing that really uh, you have found to be provocative either to you or to other people's imagination that sort of, if it doesn't embody all of this, how could it, this almost impossible to imagination depth of time that at least um, resonates with people as something that they can touch and see or discover. Or perhaps it will speak to the kind of work you're doing now or the kind of sites mm -hmm. that have over past, but please do. The materiality of it all is very important. It's, it's the central connection to things past that, that help us to, to thrust them forward into the present and into the future. So, you know, archaeology is about materiality. It's, it's less about studying the past than it is the material conditions of human existence. But this, this, uh, this problem that I've been struggling with is um, the incommensurability of the ancient past and the present and future. So uh, when you say a thing, when I think of a thing, I think of the larger context of things. A site like uh, the Civic Ceremonial Center that dates from AD 400 to 650, we worked at for about eight years now and brought it to closure with some typical academic publications. But my most proudest uh, achievement with that is working with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and with their friends group to develop a, um, an interpretive trail through the site that enables people to um, put themselves in those places that 1,500 years ago were constructed in the context of relatively rapid environmental change. And to understand how the cosmology of the people lived there connected with their practices how they were able to use the, their sense of cyc cyclic change or cyclic change, excuse me, to uh, anticipate futures that would be inevitable. Um, and I thought that it would really resonate with people. And I certainly have a great following in the town of Cedar Key. I go and give these talks and, you know, a standing room only. And I'm really like flattered that people want to hear about these ancient uh, pasts. But I don't feel like it resonates much with the present. So, um, so starting last year, I redirected my efforts to the history of this island town called Atsadi Uh it, it was the locus of, uh, of a late uh, 19th century cedar mill industry. In fact, it was Eberhard Faber's cedar mill. He bought up a bunch of land in the county and started to, uh, to harvest the cedar. It was world renowned as some of the best cedar in the world. And of course, it was for making pencils. Uh, an 1896 hurricane destroyed the mill and most of the 50 houses, households that were on this island. And over the next few decades, it was gradually abandoned. So it's now an abandoned, they call it a ghost town, it's part of the National Wildlife Refuge. That history is all but forgotten with the local community. And the hurricane, if it is remembered, it's, it's usually attributed as being um, the cause for the abandonment of the island without much discussion about how the, uh, the life ways, the industry, the land use practices, in fact, uh, made that community so vulnerable to the impacts of a hurricane, right? So they kind of fetishize the hurricane without looking beyond that to understand why the hurricane was impactful to begin with. So the goal of the project is to use archaeology along with, of course, archival information, which is kind of new for me. I don't have archival information for 2,000 years ago. Oral histories, which is always fun, and we're going to craft this new kind of history. It's ultimately going to be an interactive virtual world that will enable, enable visitors to experience at San Diego in the late 19th century and explore the conditions that made the town so vulnerable to the impact of this hurricane. Our hope is that a multi-sensory engagement, a multi-sensory engagement uh, with that past will find greater purchase on perceptions of futures yet to come. Um, and I have a lot of different stakeholders involved, so there's lots of different stories to tell, some of which are contradictory, but that's part of I think the credibility of it is, is that there's not one story to be told. Like Jacqueline said, it's not about me, it's not about the ego, or about advancing my academic career. It's about letting those stories come to the forefront and through a, through a dialogic process, perhaps uh, increase public awareness and, and consciousness about futures yet to come. Um, I'd like, I th Nicholas, you asked me in the prompt before to what I think the relationship is between land and water and how it influences my relationship between uh, what I think about the past and the future. So I thought about that and I'd like to think that land is to the present as water is to the future, which is to say 
that the terrestrial landscape I work in will be underwater sometime in the future, perhaps by the end of the century. Uh, if that's the case, then the future, i.e. water, will consume much of the materiality of the past, i.e. land, and then events like hurricane, uh, they result in these discontinuities of communities that really um, uh, erode the, the potential for social memory to carry these experiences forward across generations. So this is my real interest here. I'm really interested in how events like hurricanes are remembered in ways other than oral history and try to create capacities for creating memories out of new experiences. How are they materialized in things like ruins and monuments, memorials, the rebuilt environment? I, a few weeks ago, I went to Mexico Beach to see how they're doing after nearly two years of Hurricane Michael uh, leveling 85% of the infrastructure there. And next Sunday, I'm leaving for Galveston, Texas, and I'm gonna go down to uh, Indianola, Texas. Of course, Galveston in 1900 was largely destroyed, but they rebuilt with a three mile long seawall and 18 feet of fill. Indianola was abandoned as a great port town in the middle 19th century after two hurricanes, I think 1884 or so was the last one that drove them away. And then on the way back, I'm gonna stop by the Lower Ninth Ward in New Orleans to see how it's doing after 15 years of Katrina. I guess in visiting these other places, I'm trying to build a greater context to understand how memories of past storms shape the stories about the future under varying economic, social, political, and even just actual physical circumstances. Yeah, I mean, I love this idea, Ken, of the social memory as a kind of radical futurity, which I think is where we began really with Jacqueline and thinking about these methods and practices and ethical commitments that we all have to orchestrate again different partnerships and alliances to help imagine our present in a different way that might be to the benefit of more in the future as we close up here and that was such a wonderful rich wide deep conversation i wanted to maybe beginning with you jacqueline as we begin to sum up just if you had any thoughts now and what it means to even just to be part of a conversation like this today, what will you go off thinking about afterwards? Well, I'm thinking about this, the, the social histories question that the, I'm, I'm gonna, you said it so beautifully, I'm gonna um, mess it up, but different, you know, the people who tell the story of now will, will enable those coming after us to understand better how to, how to live, right? And how to experience. I think about the American theater, especially, right? Because like, if you can't gather shoulder to shoulder, we can't do theater. Um, we know theater has survived many, many plagues, many, many, you know, economic disasters. And I think about 1917, 1918 flu. What we don't have are the stories of how the everyday people not only survived, but rebuilt. And because we don't have those stories to look at, it feels impossible right now to see beyond beyond today, even though I want I want the world we re-enter to look differently and, and maneuver differently and social structures to be completely different, because you know, why not? We're at a pause, let's let's rebuild it. Um, but I think about it is so, I mean, a core of my work is um, inclusion, you know, access, equity, diversity, inclusion work, um, dismantling systems of oppression. And why it is so important that this work is community led. It's that the people who we get to ask these questions of to tell their stories, we have to make sure that we're telling the stories of more than just those in powerful positions. You know, like we're in great positions of privilege right now to be at universities, to have this amazing funding, to do this work that like really propels our dreams forward, you know, um, and answers big questions about the world. And I just want to make sure that we are asking the questions of the people who don't necessarily have that same level of access to hear their stories because we're gonna need those moving forward. So, and, and it's something that each of you have talked about so, so beautifully, this power of stories, and then the impact of what happens when you don't have the access to your history. I mean, I don't have a great access to, to a huge part of my own history um, and how that changes the way you show up in the world and how you're able to move forward. So we have really important work to do. That's what I'm left with. Thank you very much. Steve? You know, I would say the same thing that this conversation um, sponsors the um, exact kind of existential flexibility um, that 
that we need folks to be in when they have conversations about what we're going to do collectively. Um, if, if we can so easily have conversations that um, don't go anywhere or uh, people get their backs up, um, but if you have this uh, mode or voice um, where folks are connected to the stories of past peoples and can, can feel them as if they are present um, and, and connect those to the stories of their own families um, and those places that are sacred to them. Um, I think you, you put them in a place where they're going to tell a different story. They're going to have a different feeling. They may even have a different politics. Um, and, and so I think this conversation is the exact kind of conversation that needs to be sponsored uh, everywhere. Thank you. Ken? Yeah, uh, well, archaeology has always been a team sport, but for 35 years of my career, I've been the coach and I've had all these players that I tell them what to do and I control the narrative. So joining the, the Mellon group with Terry Harpole, Jack Davis, and Cynthia Barnett here at the University of Florida has really kind of broadened my uh, perspective that, you know, the kind of work that I'm doing could actually resonate with other people's efforts uh, and I could, I could improve and expand upon what I do by listening to their alternative ideas and their criticisms of my work, which has been very helpful. I really feel we're, you know, we're really at, a, humanities are at a difficult juncture in history where, you know, the stems have been pushed really hard. Our enrollments are down at the University of Florida. It's true in social sciences as well. And it's really unfortunate because I think that part of our problem here is that um, whereas academic scholars across the world have, have come to understand that there is nothing terribly exceptional about modernity, um, that it's an illusion. And I, I think I could paraphrase Harry Truman as something like the only thing that's new in this world is the history you don't know. So, you know, I, I think this, this has been a great opportunity for me to get out of my academic world to think about how to craft histories and narratives that aren't um, necessarily driven by my own interest, but by those that I, that I absorb by interacting with other people, that I can help them mobilize those things. So uh, yeah, this group's been really helpful for me to do that, but also to be out there with the public, which I really enjoy doing, um, has probably been the most mind-expanding experiences I've had in a long, long time. So mm -hmm. thank you. Well, for my own part, I must say one of the great pleasures of being involved in this kind of work has been discovering the work of so many brilliant colleagues across these great public institutions, which I think you were all helping to evolve and change and rebuild, as you put it, Jacqueline, as you do this kind of work. So I want to thank you all again for your time today. This is going to be a really rich resource for anyone anywhere in the world interested in community alliance and coastal study. And to wish you all to take care during this time of pandemic. And to thank the Mellon Foundation again for supporting us all. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.